welcome, Congresswoman. It's great to be talking to you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here and great to see you back. Great to be back home here in New Mexico. It's a cloudy afternoon and actually the thunder is rumbling, getting ready to monsoon over here. So it's a great day to talk about water. Yes, right before you logged on, I had a big boom of thunder here. So hopefully we'll, <laughs> we'll get through. Um, so you have been very busy um, and in particular with some water bills lately. I kind of wanted to go one by one and I was hoping we could start with the Rio Grande Water Security Act. Yeah, well, just the bigger picture. So actually this last week, we just passed a whole package of drought and wildfire bills in the House of Representatives. We passed 48 bills that were packaged together to help address drought, uh, water resilience and fire resilience in the Western United States as we're facing these unprecedented challenges. And it was led by the House Natural Resources Committee and our leadership and Joe Nagoose, who's my colleague to the North from Colorado. And I was extraordinarily fortunate to have three of my water bills included, as well as our hermit Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire uh, response bill as well. So of the three bills that were included, the Rio Grande Water Security Act is a piece of legislation that would create a framework for collaboration on the Rio Grande. And as you've been reporting and so many of our water experts have been talking about, you know, we're seeing the Rio Grande drying in places that we haven't seen in decades, especially here in the central Rio Grande through the Albuquerque Turkey area. And our bill is really designed to help create a collaborative process to help prevent that from happening going forward. So what we know about climate change is that for the last several decades, we're already seeing the signature of climate change in our river, river systems and, and the changing weather patterns, the lack of snowpack, and these strange storms and, um, and, and uh, rain patterns that we're seeing. And so if we're going to be able to address the long-term resilience of our communities, we really need to be able to manage our river at scale. And so this bill creates that framework. It brings all of the federal agencies that help to manage water together. It brings the state of New Mexico, Colorado, and Texas to the table, our tribes and our pueblos, and our local stakeholders, and those who care about water, our acequias and um, water managers, irrigation districts, so that we can build a collaborative plan for the Rio Grande and not just sue each other over water. And it also provides flexibility in how our federal agencies manage those water systems. So one of our big challenges, especially this year, as we're trying to meet the moment and this uh, strange drought that we're having along with monsoon rains, is how do we meet our compact requirements at the same time that we make deliveries to our pueblos and our tribes and also meet the needs of our water contractors, our farmers and our cities. And it's been very difficult because we don't have a lot of flexibility in how we manage the system. So this bill would create that framework so that the agencies have that uh, flexibility in managing our federal reservoirs and uh, the irrigation systems as well as helps to authorize new programs for conservation and restoration of the river itself. Yeah, so that's also, it's it's all great to hear, you know, um, it was hard for people to see the drying in the Rio Grande in the Albuquerque reach last week. And you know what I hear from so many people as I'm covering it is, is what can we do? And, and people want to know what they can do besides conserve water or call their lawmaker. But I feel like you really kind of got at the meat of this that it is a bigger process mm -hmm. and it, it requires the help of Congress. It requires funding. But I'm curious, from your perspective, when people feel helpless in seeing these tragedies occurring, you know, what you would say to people when they want to be doing something? Yeah, well, I think it's really important that people understand the bigger picture, and that's why your coverage of this issue is really important. You know, while each of us has a part to play in terms of conserving water and using less water, this is really a problem that has to be addressed at scale across the entire watershed. So 
The Rio Grande is one of our most iconic rivers. It stretches 1900 miles from Colorado down to the Gulf of Mexico. It sustains millions and millions of people both in the United States and in Mexico. And you know, while individual conservation efforts in your home and your yards is important, it really has to do with the larger ways in which we manage the river. So for example, this summer, because we did not have a lot of storage in our reservoirs, because for the last several years, we haven't had snowpack year after year, we had almost no monsoon season last year, and we had very dry soils, and we have a La Nina year right now, which is impacting the weather patterns. We really didn't have a backup to deal with the water shortages that we were going to see this year. Luckily, we got some monsoons that helped us get through the season a little bit longer, but there wasn't that flexibility to help meet our compact requirements to Texas and make those water deliveries for our senior water rights holders um, so that we could keep water in the river for our fish and for the bosque. And so in order to address that, we really need solutions at scale. We have to provide those big answers in how our water managers can manage the overall flow of the river to optimize it for all of these different needs. And I think that the best thing that citizens can do is to lift up these issues and to call your lawmakers, to call your Congress people and your senators and your state legislators and tell them how much these issues matter to you and that you want to see these bigger, longer term solutions. And you know we do need more water conservation and we do need um, other smaller scale solutions as well, but, but these really big structural problems are what we really need to tackle in the next several decades because climate change is so big and so massive and is going to affect our hydrologic systems in such significant ways. It's not just enough to you know water your lawn less and put in zero escaping. We're really gonna have to fundamentally rethink the entire system. Yeah, as overwhelming as that is to hear, it's also very refreshing to hear, hear Congresswoman. So I appreciate your um, taking seriously the scale of, of the issue. I wanted to move on to the Water Data Act, which might sound familiar to New Mexicans who pay attention to the state legislature. Um, what is the Water Data Act and what would that do? Well, I'm very excited about the Water Data Act. And um, for those of you who've been following water issues, you know that New Mexico passed our nation's second Water Data Act in 2019. And in many ways, it was the most forward looking uh, Water Data Act in the United States and very much was a model for this national legislation. And I helped to craft that legislation along with our uh, cattle growers and ranchers and farmers and conservationists and our state agencies and science organizations here in the state modeled after some of the work that had been done in previous federal uh, administrations to really streamline and standardize the way that we collect data and provide data so that we can help those who are managing water on the ground. And the best way that I can explain the impact and importance of this legislation is to point out that the most significant thing that has probably transformed our lives over the last 20 to 30 years is this. And that is the ability to access significant amounts of data and information at your fingertips through modern electronics. And while we've transformed and made data available across all different kinds of sectors from geospatial and maps and shopping and all these different realms in which we use data every single day. Amazingly, we haven't done the same in the field of water. And it's sort of inconceivable since water is so fundamental to life and important to everything that we do that we haven't transformed our water data in that way. But if we're really going to get a handle on climate change and drought and be able to manage our water systems in real time and meet all of these competing needs, we really have to modernize the way that we collect and make data available. So the Federal Water Data Act creates a process through which the federal agencies that collect water data would work with the private and nonprofit sectors and states and tribes to really create a 
a framework that standardizes it so that we can unlock the power of big data to really transform how we manage water going forward. And ultimately, if we're successful in this effort, not just in passing the bill, but really about doing the work, it will transform how we manage water. And I can point to geospatial data because in 2000, when we were first seeing this huge growth in the use of maps and geospatial data and Google Maps, um, it wasn't standardized and it really was a barrier to deploying that data in lots of different realms. And a similar federal effort came together and that's how we made it possible for you to use geospatial and mapping data in almost every app that you have on your phone and iPad. And so what our hope is, is that we'll see a similar transformation with water data that will help our farmers and ranchers and researchers really provide that information on the ground. So the third bill that is getting um, rolled into this bigger um, Wildfire Response and Drought Resiliency Act is your Water Smart Access for Tribes Act. Um, what is that and, and how will that affect, could that affect New Mexico? So the Water Smart Access for Tribes Act is very simple. It basically allows the Secretary of Interior to waive cost sharing requirements to get federal grants to support our tribes in water conservation and resilience projects. And what we know is, especially here in New Mexico, so many of our communities do not have the capacity to leverage significant amounts of infrastructure dollars on the ground. And uh, it's a barrier to entry to getting federal money when you don't have the ability to provide a cost share. And the Water Smart program has been around for over a decade at the federal level. And we've seen disproportionately that our tribal communities have not been accessing those grants. So this bill basically allows the secretary to say, you know what, we're gonna waive or reduce that cost share so that you can access this funding and implement projects. I also wanna note that our Rio Grande Water Security Act includes another tribal water infrastructure bill that is a huge priority for the Pueblos, especially here in the middle of Rio Grande, which is the Pueblo Irrigation Fund. And for many, many years, our Pueblos have fought to get federal funding to help upgrade their acequia and their irrigation infrastructure, which is important not only for farming, but just the use of water on the Pueblos. And so we were able to fold that legislation into the larger Rio Grande bill and get bipartisan support for that. So we're really excited about that as well. I think it's safe to say and fair to say that oftentimes the rest of the country doesn't really pay attention to New Mexico's water issues. Like maybe our, our devastating giant fires this year sort of grab headlines for a little bit. Um, do you think that these bills that are focused specifically on water are maybe helping educate some of your health colleagues on what's happening here? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, I've worked on water issues for two decades, and I know you have as well. And one of the things that I've often heard in the field of water resources is that water is just too hard. How do we solve these huge problems around water? Because they're so contentious and they're so core and fundamental to our survival and livelihoods. You know, everybody loves to cite the saying that water is for fighting over, but in every instance across history, while there have always been conflicts around water and water rights, humans always find a way to cooperate around water. And increasingly what we're seeing with climate change and more demands on our river systems and water systems is that collaborative frameworks is how you really solve problems. And I had the fortune of working in Congress for several years and working in the administration on water and climate issues. And these kinds of collaborative solutions that leverage science, that bring resources to the table, that create collaborative frameworks with the stakeholders themselves, are really the next generation way that we're going to get through this crisis. And so the bills that are included in this legislation, and I would say in particular, the Water Data Act, I think have really sparked people's imagination and excitement that not only do we have to tackle these water issues, but that it is possible to do so by putting tools and resources into the hands of our communities. And, you know, I never thought in a million years that my career would become defined around the very nerdy activity of making data and science more available for addressing our water challenges. 
but it seems to be one of the core things that really brings stakeholders together. So that bill in particular, you know, it, was, it passed here in our legislature on a completely bipartisan basis with unanimous support in both chambers and had a incredibly diverse support from everyone from the New Mexico cattle growers and Farm Bureau to the Audubon and um, you know conservation voters of the world. And we see that same support at the federal level. We have the Family Farm Alliance and the Farm Bureau supporting us. And we've got um, members on both sides of the aisle and very different ideological perspectives who say, yes, this is what we need. We need collaborative ways of bringing science and information to our communities so that we can solve problems. So. Yes, I think that when you bring real solutions to the table that are really focused on empowering our communities, it's something that everyone can buy into. And I think it gives people hope that we can actually tackle these challenges. Yeah, so um, we're talking on Monday, August 1st. Um, what do you anticipate happening with the Wildfire Response and Drought Resiliency Act? What sort of the process there? So the bill has been compiled in the House and it passed out of the House chamber last week, actually on Friday. It was one of the last bills that we passed before we wrapped for the summer session. We're now in August recess and uh, you know we won't be back officially in session until September, but I think it's important to know also today um, that we are in the process of trying to pass the most significant and historic investment in climate change that our country has ever seen through a climate and uh, healthcare reconciliation package in the Senate. And so we may be called back uh, in the coming weeks to help pass that. Um, you know, it's an election year. And so it's always difficult to protect, pre predict the legislative pathway for legislation in election years. But oftentimes what happens is big packages come together towards the end of the year during the lame duck. And that's often when you see what we call large omnibus packages. Sometimes they're public lands packages. Sometimes they get coupled with the budget. Sometimes they um, come together as, you know, just sort of big deals at the end of the year. And so what we are fighting for right now is to get this legislation uh, on every possible vehicle that we can in the Senate and get it across the finish line. And you know, for us, these are must pass bills, including the Hermit's Peak bill, which will help to make our communities whole again, who were impacted by the Hermit's Peak and Calf Canyon fires. So we're gonna fight till the end to make sure that that legislation passes. And um, we're working very closely with Senators Heinrich and Lujan and the chair, chairpersons in the Senate to find the appropriate vehicle and package to get it through. All right. Well, Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. Well, thank you for having us and just really, really appreciate it and all your coverage of these important issues, because as we all know, water is life. And, um, you know, you are one of the most important journalists covering this issue every day, day in and day out. So we appreciate everything that you do to keep New Mexico informed.